Welcome everybody to this episode of the Tabletop Battlefield Live. I'm Jason, the creator of the Tabletop Battlefield, and we're continuing with the series of painting the Cypher miniatures. This is Cypher, Lord of the Fallen, released about six months ago or so by Games Workshop as part of the triumphant of the Primark. And I've been slowly painting them up over the past few hours, getting making progress here. So today, the plan is to um, probably see if I can paint the inside of the hood of his cape, get a little bit of red in there without screwing up his face. That that could be a challenge because no matter what way you do it, whether it's face first, hood first, you really risk getting color where you don't want the color. So it's going to be a bit of an adventure trying to get in there and not screw things up. Talk, talk about being very, very careful. I think his eyes are open, so I may try to put a little bit of dab of white in there for his eyes. But that could be adventurous. And then we're going to start working more on the sword and the backpack that he has on his back. And that's basically our battle plan for today. So let me slide back over to my new close-up miniature camera here. And I finally got this camera in manual focus mode. So as long as I hold the miniature here, it'll be easy to see. It'll always be in focus. So no more of the weird, like, my hand tripping the autofocus on the camera because, you know, it's closer and it's bigger. I've got that locked in to keep the miniature down like this, and I should be in good shape. So let's start by getting in there with some Mephiston Red. Oops, sorry, that's, that's Evil Sun Scarlet I grabbed. Mephiston Red here. That's like the kind of darker red base color from Games Workshop Citadel line. Put a little bit of that down on my, uh, on my wet palette. This has been my Cypher wet palette here. You can see all the different colors I've been using on Cypher. And now we need to apply very small, and I mean very small amounts of paint. This is one of those things where you screw it up, you're going to be redoing his face. And then if you screw that up, you got to redo the inside of the hood. And you can see how it becomes this never-ending, absolute nightmare thing going on. But I think our subtopic for today, our discussion topic, since it's, you know, it's not really a subtopic because I'm just painting a miniature and talking, I thought I would talk about some of the new tabletop games that are coming out or just games in general that I'm kind of interested in trying because one of them is not new. I just haven't tried it yet. And so let's start there, as I'm very carefully trying to paint red on the inside of this hood. And, you know, it, we're getting close to Christmas season here. It's October. I'm one of those weird guys who listens to Christmas music come November 1st, but that's because, you know, I love Christmas music. And I don't listen to the normal Christmas music. Whole long story to there. But regardless, um, that means... I need to start planning for the Tabletop Battlefield's annual Christmas special that we do once a year. And I know already sitting next to me is one part of that particular show. And if you've missed some of the other live streams I've done, we are doing, myself, Ryan, and Kyle have now confirmed. We've got to set a time for all three of us to participate. We are doing a, a speed build of the LEGO UCS Rebel Snow Speeder from Star Wars. What the heck? That's, I still have it sitting next to my desk for some reason. Probably because I don't actually have a spot in my apartment for this giant box. <laughs> so this is the monster we're building up as part of the Tabletop Battlefield Christmas special. Um, and that's why it's just been sitting next to my, my table here because I can stick it under my table and get it out of the way. But I think that the... Other part of the show is going to be covering one of two games for us. The first one I'm going to pick up on Sunday. This is the this is the game is not new, but I've kind of been interested in it from a design perspective, and it's Star Wars Destiny. Uh, Fancy Flight. This is a Fancy Flight game. I believe they're the only ones who have a license to make Star Wars tabletop games. And they made a whole bunch of them in the past, you know, a few years. X-Wing, Armada, Rebel something. Imperial Assault. I always want to call that Descent-like game Rebel Assault. I know that was the video game series. Um, Imperial Assault, whatever. So Star Wars Destiny. I'm, I'm interested in it from a game design perspective. Because, of course, you know, I make Legends of Caladasia. And I've always had an interest 
in collectible card games. We years ago we talked about. I know it came up at least a few times in the Tabletop Battlefield podcast back in the day. The very first game that I designed was Control, Dominate, Destroy. It was a really silly collectible card game it was, that was based, originally, based very, very heavily on Command and Conquer. Uh, it, it diverged a fair amount and got pretty obscenely ridiculous, as card, collectible card games tend to do with all sorts of weird, super powerful units and things, and it never really, you know, whatever. It was just something fun we did as kids, but it was it was a fun experiment for me. It actually went pretty well, dang. <laughs> I'm looking here at the, the red inside the hood. I actually did a pretty good job of that without getting a whole lot of paint everywhere. Um, I don't think I actually got any paint on his face. I think I'm going to make the very edge of the hood like out here be red I think that'll look cool and I'm not going to try to do any evil sun scarlet highlighting because like on the rest of the inside of the cloak I did the Mephiston red base with the evil sun scarlet kind of highlighting and then I did some seraphin sepia washing I'm not even going to try to attempt that that's just suicide um <laughs> in this situation but I am going to put a little red brim around the front of the cloak here just to give a little bit of just flavor to it. But so Star Wars Destiny, it's kind of this hybrid card and dice management system. So and it's, it's essentially, I was watching some videos of it. I haven't played it yet, but I've watched some YouTube videos of it. You build a team of heroes and characters from the Star Wars universe, and then you battle out, battle out, by having a collectible card style deck where you you know you build power ups and support units and things like that to help your main characters out, but then each character as well as some of the support things which aren't technically characters but they're supports and weapons and stuff give you dice to roll, and these dice then they're effectively sort of resources per se in the sense there's you know, there's a concept of resources in the game. But they're one other thing you manage to give you the ability to do stuff, such as, you know, buy cards, do damage to your opponent, and other things like that. And then on top of that, there is the, an aspect of managing the dice. Because just like in collectible card games, somebody or some faction or some group often has the idea of deck management, where you kind of shuffle your deck around and try to get the cards you want, things like that. You have that in Star Wars Destiny as well, because there's a collectible card aspect to it. But um, you also have this dice management thing. So you can rotate dice. You can re some guys can re-roll them, stuff like that. And that is also another way you can kind of build your deck to manipulate and you know improve your odds of winning a game. So it's it seems like a very interesting concept. It's just a little bit of a nice variation on your typical collectible card game stuff. And I'm kind of interested in it from a game design perspective. So this this weekend I'm going to pick up a, the starter set. I think the starter set is some episode 7. <laughs> no, I, I always give episode 7 crap. Um, there's nothing... <sighs> Star Wars episode 7, there really isn't anything fundamentally wrong with it from a filmmaking pers perspective. It's just that I wanted something different because I've seen all the Star Wars films, and it was, at its very core, a Star Wars film with, you know, a Death Star-like thing, a fighter battle attacking it, all sorts of, you know, your hero jet, one of, you know, hero developing Jedi thing, in this case is Rey. So, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things where just as someone who's seen all the films before, I kind of wanted something a little bit more, and I just got more of the same, which... You know, if you're new to Star Wars, as in, you know, the whole, it's Star Wars has always kind of been a little bit more of a kid-friendly franchise than, you know, say, Warhammer 40,000. <laughs> but then again, everything is kid-friendly compared to Warhammer 40,000. Well, except some other... Well, yeah, there is some mesh. Um, <laughs> so I don't know. Um, yeah, but... So there's a whole generation of kids, you know, who aren't terribly familiar with Star Wars who probably find it amazing... And that was a fantastically awesome, fun movie to him. I did see it twice, by the way. So I did enjoy it enough to see it twice. It's it's one of those, I enjoyed it as a movie, but I really wanted more from from you know Star Wars and what I got is what it came down to. 
All right, but anyway, let me, okay, I'm not gonna talk here right now because I'm trying to very carefully stab him, Cypher in the eye. This is gonna go very poorly. It almost always does. My hands are not the most stable things. Hold my breath. Could have been worse. <laughs> you probably can't see it. Oh uh, yeah, and, like just barely on the camera, you can see like a little bright spot in, in there where I kind of stabbed him in the eye. Um, I'll clean it up a tiny bit, but you know, that isn't as bad as it could be. I've, I've done a lot worse. Let me try to stab him in the other eye now. Where's the other eye? It's like I'm holding from weird angles. I can't tell where his other eye is. Okay, I want to go right in there. Oh, I missed the eye. Okay, I'm gonna just take him off camera, and then I can I can see really really close because I just missed his eye. Okay, I got it that time. The problem with the only problem with this little camera setup I have here, as nice as it is for you guys to be able to see it, I can't really get really close to the miniature. I, just because the camera's in the way. So if I want to do something really super fine like that, I, I really just need to pick the miniature up and take it away from the camera. But now I've got to clean up his face a little bit because I missed one eye here, and that eye is way too big. Let's say I, like, I don't know, looks like his eye, is, his eye is just slowly leaking out. And no, I'm if I'm going to put an eyeball or a pupil in there, I'm going to use, like, a fine Sharpie or something. I'm not going to try to paint that in. That's just going to end very poorly. <laughs> Okay, maybe I'll try. Why not? Okay, I'm going to try right now anyway. Before I clean up my mess, let me just try. Because that way, if I really hose it up, I don't have to clean my mess up twice. <laughs> so I'm just going to get some bad and black out here. And we're going to try to give him a tiny, tiny... Oh, I already have a ton of black on my wet palette. One minute here. That's the beauty of, like, you know, wet palette is that I've, I've got paint literally from, like, four or five, six days ago. And it's still perfectly good. So I gotta, I gotta move him away from the camera because I need to do this very, very carefully and I just can't see that level of detail with the camera on, with the camera in place. So I'm just gonna very, I'm very gently trying to stab him in the eye again. Close enough. Other eye. Now, there we go, so I, can't, I don't know if you can see two little dark dots in there. It's funny how that camera just like really makes those tiny little details look so big, probably because they're such high contrast and the rest of the skin around them. I, I swear it doesn't look that bad, but I'm gonna go ahead and clean those eyes up a little bit. So, tiny amounts of white, and I'm using, for the white, I'm using Linen White from Reaper Master Series. Uh, it's just a slightly off-white color, and I, I've come to really enjoy, enjoy, I guess enjoy, sure, what the hell. i come to really like that color for just white in general, because um, the thing you'll learn from when I've been doing digital painting, you know, pure white is not something you really want to use all that much. Pure white is supposed to be that very painful bright white light that you you know you see the reflection off a car or something metal and it just it just blinds you right there we go i've kind of cleaned the eyes up a little bit but i gave a little bit more white to the pupil to the eyes so now i gotta go back in there with some flesh colors and and clean them up you know what i can do watch let's do this let's swap over to this camera i kind of so at least you can see me painting instead of just a, you know, a nothingness thing. Because <laughs> it's not like terribly exciting for you guys when I'm trying to paint this tiny little detail. And I got this fancy new camera set up and I can't show you what I'm doing. So I'm going to very carefully here, so at least you can see me that I'm indeed painting. It's not the most ideal setup. I'll get back to my secondary camera in a moment. I'm going to do my best to clean up the all the white screw-ups from where I basically made his eye half the size of his head. <laughs> but 
But, so, anyway, in regards to that Star Wars Destiny I was talking about, in terms of, well, that's what I'm going to give, we're probably going to talk about at the Tabletop Battlefield Christmas special. I, we'll see, I know Ryan's going to be interested in trying it. Kyle, I don't know. <laughs> Kyle's relationship with Star Wars is very, very complicated. <laughs> Maybe I'll have him talk about it on the show this year. Um, ideally, though, what I the other game coming out that I'm fairly ex interested in, to some extent, anyway. Um, at least I should put the disclaimer. It's more has to do with a lot of my friends want to play it, so I'm like, oh, what the heck? Let's go ahead and buy the starter set. It's only ninety bucks or something like that. And it's Star Wars Legion, which once again, Fantasy Flight. Fantasy Flight is going seriously all out. They got Games Workshop. You know, like, uh, bull, they got a bullseye in Games Workshop, and they're going for them. Um, you know, I've kind of speculated before, this is probably why their Warhammer board game deal fell apart earlier in, earlier in the year, or late last year. Because who knows, you know, you have no idea what their negotiations were, blah, blah, blah. I've talked about this before, but... We saw Rune Wars, that was their Warhammer Fantasy competitor, and then now Star Wars Legion, which is very clearly a Warhammer 40,000 competitor. It's squad, you know, it's squad based. You've got um, different types of units. You have army building system very similar to Warhammer 40,000. There's even like you know troops and kind of equivalents of heavy support and things like that. I swear I'm getting worse with every brush stroke here. <laughs> Let me slide over to the camera. <laughs> I'm trying to salvage his face as best I can as I'm talking here about Star Wars Legion. Um, the issue with that game right now is I don't really know what the release date is. When I pick up the Star Wars Destiny stuff, I'll see if I can get a, a release date. Uh, when I pre-ordered it, I heard quarter four 2017. And when Fantasy Flight says quarter X of some year, they mean the last day of that quarter. <laughs> they have routinely on multiple games. That was, they hit whatever, you know, if it was the first quarter, they hit March 31st, 2017 as a release day. They, they, they do that. So it's a, you, as a company, you know, maybe they would, I don't know. I don't know if they want it out for, for Christmas or not. You know, there'd be an, Ideally for them, they'd probably want out around the time Star Wars Episode Eight comes out. That that'd be their big tie-in. Even though it's um, you know classic Star Wars Episode Four ish, whatever. So, all right, I think that'll work. He's he's got something that kind of looks like eyes in there. I don't really care. Um, you can tell there's something in there. It almost looks like he's soulless, but he's cipher, and who knows what cipher really is. All right, so let's start cleaning up a few things. I, I want to clean up, before I move to the backpack, as I mentioned earlier, I want to fix up this this chain right here and this little mouthpiece thing. Oh, 3D printer's done. Whoops, don't bump my camera over. My 3D printer's done. As I mentioned, my 3D printer's done. That is... I'm printing up something kind of cool, actually, for tabletop games that you guys will be seeing in a few weeks here. It was... Looking pretty good as before I started filming, so I think the print probably turned out really good. I've got Ultimaker. Ultimaker's... I've had one issue with it that was kind of annoying to deal with, but that sucker. I get... I have like a 90 plus percent print success ratio with that printer. I love it. I, I assume that's a good ratio. I don't know. I really have no idea. Um, but it's been stunning. Anyway, this is some Dawnstone Gray. I'm putting a little bit on this little mask. Not mask. It looks like almost like a rebreather thing below his hood here and then I'm going to do the same thing to this chain that he's wearing that's holding his cape on so this is part of my silver pink that I like to do it I always put down this a layer of dawnstone gray first and that kind of gives it a nice tarnished silver look to the whole process. So with Star Wars Legion, 
I have, you know, I've watched a battle report of it. It was at Gen Con. Some YouTube channel was giving, was getting a nice overview of it from Fantasy Flight Games themselves. So they're introducing kind of your basic game. It's they're really very well painted models, and I mean the models they look fantastic. I I don't know if they're the soft bendy plastic like what Rune Wars is, or if they're more like you know the stuff that tra traditional miniatures are made of. But they look amazing. I mean they look very very good. So if uh, Fancy Flight has figured out how to make like really good bendy plastic miniatures, then that's really pretty freaking cool. Um, but I guess we will see once I get the miniatures in hand exactly what they are. I, I know some people, some people have done some painting videos on them. I don't know where they got them from, but I'm sure it's out there as to what type of miniatures they are already. Unless for some reason they would change it in production, but I don't know. You never really know. There, I am, you know, with any new game though, I am a little bit hesitant on it. It's like, well, it looks like it could be cool. There's a few things I'm not really sure about. They they made some comment about your command radius with your commander and how that interacts with things, and that seemed a little odd to me. So I don't know. I've you know it was it was an offbeat off kind of it was just kind of a random comment that the the guy running the game said that that kind of got me a little bit concerned. But I don't know. I guess I got it pre-ordered, so I think I'm looking forward to at least trying it out. Because the situation you know I'm in with my local gaming group is well, we all kind of gave up on Games Workshop. <laughs> Not all of us, a good portion of the gaming club, probably 80%, has pretty much given up in Games Workshop. They were, most of the people were old time Games Workshop pl players. So for example, I've been playing, I was playing 40K, started playing 40K about 10 years ago, 11 years ago now, 2006. It was actually about July 2006 is the reason why I know that date. But anyway, um... It was July 2006 when I started playing Warhammer 40,000. And I was kind of one of the more recent players in the group, right? There have been several people there who have been playing since first, since Rogue Trader, since second edition, third edition. So I was a relatively newcomer in terms of 40K. And I think they just kind of got tired of, of it. it. The games changed over the years. Um... So there just wasn't a whole lot of interest in playing it again. I haven't played 8th edition yet. I just enjoy painting up the miniatures every now and then. They're still fantastic miniatures. And Cypher was a guy that I always just wanted. I, he was such a cool character storyline-wise. And like, I want this miniature. So that's why Star Wars Legion comes along. They're, everyone there is a pretty, have, pretty big fan of Star Wars. A couple of them play Armada. A few of them used to play X-Wing. We'll talk about why they don't do that in a moment here. But, you know, it's so naturally this Star Wars Legion looked like a good idea to at least try out. So three of us got starter sets. So we have enough to play a little bit larger battles. I don't know if there's anything else that's going to be available at release yet. When I talked to the store owner about the pre-orders, all he had in his catalog was the starter set. Which gives you Luke Skywalker, Darth Vader... The two, I think it's two rebel squads and the walker thing, and then you've got um, two stormtrooper squads and the speeder bikes. So they may have those units individually available for sale. I'm not really sure yet, but I'm. But going back to painting here quickly, I'm putting on some lead belcher, which is a one kind of next layer up in terms of silver gray, silver color. So I'm not completely covering the gray, just just in some parts. But I think the concern that these players we have, the few that played X-Wing before when it comes to anything to do with Fantasy Flight, is they... I'm trying to tell how to describe this. They package their products in such a way that they give you incentives to buy stuff that you really didn't want to buy. 
Um, it's not as horrible as the days when we had collectible miniature boosters. Oh my goodness, I hate those days. I am so glad that collectible boosters are gone. <laughs> I think actually Heroclix still uses them. I'm not really sure. I don't know if Heroclix does or not. I, I don't pay attention to Heroclix anymore. But, um... <laughs> Hated those things with a passion. If, if you've been watching the tabletop battlefield for years, you know that those things are like my mortal enemy, collectible boosters. But what I, I guess my understanding what they would do because I never really played X-wing much. I've got a few ships for it. It's kind of you know research into the. It's like what I what's the term I like to use? Um, intelligence research into the enemy. <laughs> Same with Armada. I have some Armada stuff. I played it like twice. Um, but my understanding. From what they were telling me, is that you know they would you had upgrade cards to your units, and they would put you know upgrade cards that maybe were valuable to Empire units or just they're just generally valuable because you know they could be used for Rebels or Empire it didn't really matter, and they'd only be available say in a Rebel ship. So if you played only the Empire, you would have to buy like three of these Rebel ships to get you know a couple of different of these really cool upgrade cards, which. I can see why that could be very frustrating. And if they do something like that with Star Wars Legion or also with Rune Wars, because, you know, my, my friend who's interested in Rune Wars is also worried about them doing that with, with said Rune Wars. Um, it, I can see why that can be very, very frustrating because none of us really have lots and lots of money to be spending on tabletop games. So we don't want to be buying stuff we just don't want. Part of the reason, honestly, that why Warhammer 40,000 is so appealing. It seems kind of strange because the most probably it's always the most expensive game out there. But um, which you buy what you want, and you don't need to buy stuff you don't need. Because coming from Mech Warrior, where you you know you bought crap booster after crap booster, being able to walk in, sure you paid three times at the time is like I wonder how much did a box of Fire Wars cost back then when I started playing the game. I want to say they're only like 30 bucks. They might have been 35. I think they were 35 back in the day. The Fire Warrior, 12 man Fire Warrior squad was $35 back in the day. But you know, so paying three and a half times a Mech Warrior booster and I got 12 miniatures that I wanted instead of 12 miniatures I didn't want. Or maybe 10 miniatures that I, I you know, that I didn't want and two that I did if I was lucky. So, you know, it's. I don't, basically the point is, I don't want to buy stuff that I don't want, and I don't want to be forced to buy stuff I don't want. Now, with either game, Rune Wars or Star Wars Legion, I guess neither, no one in my group is going to really play competitively. I think our days of playing things competitively are behind us. I mean, you know, I kind of dream of wanting to do that. <laughs> you know, hey, let's go be competitive at some tabletop game. I used to play Mech Warrior competitively, and I won a few tournaments. I won a tournament, anyway. At least one. I don't know if I say a few. I'm, I think I got second place at least once. I, got, I know I got a couple of the, you know, victory special edition guys laying around. Um, yeah, I think I, I think I got second place once. Or, got, or maybe it was best sportsmanship or something like that. I forget how those other ones worked. But regardless, I know I, did win, I, know I won one tournament. <laughs> story about that one. Well, I, I mean, I can drift from story to story. It was what happened. It was a Sphinx. The enemy had a Spirit Cat Sphinx. It was a gigantic, like, 250-point mech, which was, you know, th that's like three-quarters of your army back in the day. And by the way, before I get on this story, I just put a layer of Seraphon Sepia on this chain here, and that's why it's got a little bit of gold tint to it. I'm going to put a tiny bit more on there. That's just what I was doing. But anyway, the Sphinx... <laughs> I don't you get so far off topic. The Sphinx, like I said, was like a 250-point unit, he shut himself down in like his own deployment zone or something like that, and I proceeded to capture said mech because you could you have infantry could do anti anti battle mech operations, and when you captured a enemy unit, it was worth like twice as many points as if you killed it. So because of that, I captured his central piece to his army. I scored 500 points plus blowing up the rest of his army then, plus having my entire army survive because this thing overheated and captured and like got shut down in turn two and I captured one turn later. That um, <laughs> because of all that, I scored enough points in this tournament because it's one holy screw up thing to win the tournament. It's kind of fun. Um, those days were, those were some interesting days. 
But the, the moral of that whole rambling story is that I'm probably not going to be doing much competitive play anymore. I really just don't have the time to commit to learning a new tabletop game. It really, you really got to want to stay on top of things and really buy new stuff as they come out. Um, I have no desire to do that. I, I don't want to sit in assemble miniatures all day long anymore. It's, I don't paint a whole lot outside of these videos. I mean, I've spent the last 10, so it's been 10 months in October, so we're in the middle of the 10th month of the year here. And I finally just about finished painting up 500 points of Rebel Gar from Beyond the Gates of Antares. This, this little miniature is sitting here. This is the last guy I've got to finish up painting. There's only this up here, and I might do a custom 3D printer base up for him to make him look cool. But literally, that's like that's kind of how much time I devote to painting. I granted I've painted a few Kaladashi miniatures in there because I had to for you know getting them on the store for selling them. But um, I don't do a lot of the hobby stuff anymore. So I don't have the time for it. So I don't really feel like assembling and painting tons of armies, and I don't want to take. I really just don't want to commit the time. That's what it comes down to to learn all the different meta that's out there, all the new tactics. And that's kind of the reason why I stopped playing Warhammer 40,000 in the first place, is it used to be a, about where I could bring, bring my figures to the table, we could just put our guys down. I didn't really need to know what your army did. We could just move around the tabletop, shoot weapons at each other, have a little bit of tactics going on, have fun playing it. And, you know, I just feel that more and more... It started with a lot with 7th edition, and it's not doesn't seem to be any different than 8th edition. Like I said, I haven't played 8th edition. I don't really have anybody to play it with. I guess I could go to the GW store and play it if I really, really wanted to. But the, the battle reports I watch on YouTube don't make me want to really play it. But maybe I should give, at least give it a shot sometime just to try it out. Because any game can be fun if you play it right. You just got to find the right set of players who want to play, you know, a scheme like Warhammer 40,000 and make it fun. That's really what it comes down to. And there are a lot of players out there who don't want to make it fun to play with because they just want to be vicious and brutal and rip stuff apart. But the point is, you I feel like you really have to know all the different armies that are out there, all the different tactics, how everything interacts together, and it becomes very much a list-building exercise. Which is fine with something like Star Wars Destiny because a game lasts 20 minutes, but not with a three-hour miniatures game. That just isn't fun for me. So we'll see how things shape up. Hopefully Star Wars Legion isn't like that. I don't really know if Rune Wars is like that or not. I haven't played it enough. I've only played one game of Rune Wars. I really want to play it again. So let's talk about the back of his sword here. I'm going to start painting this area. This is the bottom of the sword that's attached to his cloak. And it looks like a whole bunch of skulls. So you know what we do with skulls? Let's start with some linen white. I'm going to do my little bone painting scheme. My bone painting scheme is base with some white. And of course, you know, with every paint, especially especially with white, and it's also... Uh, yeah, no, especially with white. This, the Linen Weep Reaper series, they, 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 they. the Reaper Pro Paint series isn't really a big issue um, with this. But I just want to give it a couple thin layers of white, just so you don't fill in any detail. Because you got lots of tiny little skulls here with lots of little crevices between said skulls. And it's a gr and putting too much white paint on is a great way to just to completely obliterate detail. So it's a very fine balance between putting on paint so that it covers stuff and we're not losing all the detail. So I think that's really about all I've got to say about Star Wars Legion at this point. I know I rambled, I, I know I really got talking about X-Wing and a little bit of Armada and Mech Warrior and <laughs> rant about collectible boosters, but I think I think that covers it. I need, I'm going to pretty much reserve my effective judgment on it until it actually comes out. I mean, hopefully it'll be a fun game to play. I am. I really would like to play more of those kind of larger army scale games. Beyond the Gates of Antares is fantastic. I love it. It's a lot of fun. I haven't got to play it in about a year. Just my friends and I have been playing all sorts of other stuff. We 
played our campaign of Shadows of Brimstone. Oh, there we go. That's something I can talk about. I'm still waiting for... It's like my um my friend who did the original Kickstarter, Shadows of Brimstone. There's still some new stuff coming out for that. That, of course, is kind of... it. Be, what began as like this Cthulhu-themed Wild West Dungeon Call Adventures is Flying Frog Productions. It's added all sorts of cool stuff. Weird sci-fi tropes, these weird aliens... There's even a crashed alien ship, which he doesn't have yet. It's in stores, but he doesn't have yet because of how the Kickstarter the Kickstarter release process was going with this game. Um, there's also a giant dinosaur. There's like a velociraptor in the jungle city and stuff. So I'm really hoping to see these things at some point soon. And we can get back to that game, get back to playing that game. That game is a heck of a lot of fun. It can be... If you have someone who wants to put together a little bit of a story... It can be it can be a lot of fun. I think maybe I'll be the one to put together the story next time, and try to come with something a little bit continuing from the campaign we played. We had a campaign where we end up fighting Belial. Belial is this giant shadow demon. He's the Lord of Cinders, his title, because he um, he's basically like this shadow demon thing that controls this the realm called Cinder. I think it's what the realm is called, Cinder. It's a lot surprise surprise. It's a lava world. Now he that was our big bad uh, boss fight we had, and it, yeah, it was kind of anticlimactic. <laughs> but you know, it's a cooperative game. So with any cooperative game, this you know the monsters kind of have rules that what they do and how they can and things they can do, and we kind of figured out a way by combining all of our hero powers together and getting the right gear before the mission that we knew we were going to fight Belial in that. He, we found a way to basically shut down most of his most powerful abilities, which is, he really, he, when he hits you, he just basically kills you, but he doesn't hit you, characters a lot, it's kind of difficult for him to hit you, um, but mainly what he tries to do is he tries to summon in other demon creatures to distract you while he beats the crap out of you, but we found a way to shut down, effectively shut down his summoning, it's not, a, it wasn't a guarantee, but you know, it was roll on a three plus, and you shut down the summoning. So he only had three or four of those. And we managed to roll a three plus in all of them. So, you know, it's that's not terribly hard to do from a statistical perspective. And, you know, each one you shut down kind of has a multiplier effect. Because, you know, if you fail one of them, it becomes harder to shut, it's more harder to shut the next one down. Not because it's statistically harder, but because now your resources you're using to shut down those abilities got to be spent to fight other monsters and things. It just becomes, you know, harder to do because there's more stuff going on and more things, you know, you need to pay attention to. But we just got lucky and he just kind of fell apart. <laughs> no one actually died during the final battle and he just went down from like 100 hit points to like zero. <laughs> so a little anticlimactic, but... Overall, the campaign was a lot of fun, and a crack and destroyed a city. And <laughs> they have in between campaigns, you go visit these random towns, and one of them is is a riverboat town. This is like 1800s. So they have a paddle wheel riverboat, steamboat, on the river, and at the end of a given day, uh, when you're in town, weird stuff can happen. They have they're called town events. And it had a freaking kraken come out of the water and crush the riverboat and pull it under. <laughs> Love it. It's just this weird, crazy stuff. This game, the game is just, just gets really nutty. It's so much fun. Okay. Here we go. So, yep, they're definitely skulls now that I've got some white paint on them. I'm going to go in and to give them a little bit of a kind of a rotty bone look, if that makes any sense. Seraph and Sophia just kind of stains them a little bit and makes them makes them look old. Now these possibly could not be real skulls. They could be some sort of decoration, but it's this Warhammer forty thousand, and I don't think the granted I don't think the Imperium really knows how to make fake skulls. <laughs> they got plenty of real ones just sitting around. As horrible as that is, that's kind of that's kind of how the universe works. It's it's very depressing. Yes, I, Warhammer 40,000 is not exactly a happy universe, no. But this sword here is probably 10,000-ish years old. Supposedly, it's a sword of Lionel Johnson, the Primarch of the Dark Angels. 
I'm going to assume that's going to become more important with the stories at some point soon. But I'm not really sure. I'm just kind of making crap up. Because who knows what Games Workshop is going to do. And you can see there, just by applying a little bit of that Seraph and Sapia to it, it stains the bones, gives them a little bit of yellow discoloring. But also, by the nature of the, of the wash itself, it gives them uneven coloring. So it's not a pure, you know, solid yellowish shade. And then I'm going to go back in with some more Seraph and Sapia, and I'm going to apply just little dabs here and there to get even more of a speckled appearance. So this next layer of, this, of the wash, it's called a shade now. They call them shades now, but they're washes. It's just, this is what they call them. I'm not spreading it evenly. I'm, I'm dabbing it more or less in relatively small areas. There we go. I like how that looks. So that gives it a nice textured look to your skulls. And then I need to move on to the bottom of the sword scabbard here. Right now I've given it a base of Dawnstone Gray. So let me go ahead and I'm going to give it that kind of rusty, tarnished silver look. So I've already got the, the Dawnstone Gray down. So let's go with, oh, that's Dawnstone Gray. Here we go, Lead Belcher. And I'm just going to go over the gray area, most of the gray areas with this color here. It looks to be a little bit I missed the gray on the top of the of this little decorative piece of the scabbard, but that's fine. Just trying my best not to get the paint, you know, on the cloak. I know I got to clean up the cloak around here a little bit. There's a, there's a small amount of red. I don't know how it got there exactly, between the the bottom of the scabbard here, and the white area of the rest of the cloak. So I screwed that up a little bit. I'll fix that here in a moment. I'll finish painting this thing first, and then I'll fix that little bit of a mistake. All right, so I've got some of the Dawnstone Gray there. So next up, after Dawnstone Gray, or sorry, Lead Belcher, <laughs> Stormhost Silver, you know, I've mentioned before, this is one of my most favorite colors currently in the Games Workshop line because you can do so much cool stuff with it. Just very carefully, I'm going to, this is a very bright silver color, so I'm just going to mostly highlight a few edges, add a, maybe a little bit of it to other places just to kind of add a little bit of texture to the thing. So it's not a nice uniform gray color is really what I'm trying to avoid. Just not get it a nice uniform color. There we go. So it's just splattering a little bit of it on there. Just so you get a nice mix of the Stormhouse Silver and the Lead Belcher. Maybe even have a little bit of the Dawnstone Gray showing through. It's kind of up to you. And that helps give it a worn silver look. Like if there was, it was shiny at one point and now it's kind of grimy and dirty. And then I'm going to use the Seraph and Sapia here to give it even more of a tarnished look. So, Seraphon Sophia. And also, just like with the Stormhost Silver, you don't want to apply this all over the region of the miniature that you're painting. So I'm just going to apply some of it at the top, a little bit here, a little bit there, so that you can still see some of the really shiny silver there. It's just, you're just trying to partially discolor a few parts of where you're painting. So some other things I'm kind of looking forward to gaming-wise. I know this is something Ryan's been talking about a little bit. I don't know a whole lot about it. But apparently, um, what's his name? Craig Van Ness, I 
think it's his name. He is the one of the creators of HeroScape. I believe he is trying to, or if he already is running, he maybe already ran the Kickstarter. He was creating a, a new a new tabletop game. I don't think it's, he doesn't have the HeroScape license. Hasbro owns that. Oops, sorry, bumped the camera. I'm not sure if he's ever tried to make a attempt to get that from Hasbro. But, <coughs> oh, sorry. Cough button, cough button. Sorry about that. <clears throat> Didn't hit the cough button fast enough. Um, I don't. I don't remember what his game was. I think I actually remember seeing it on a Kickstarter now. But he he created something. Ryan was kind of interested in that. Hopefully, it shows up at some point where I can pick up a copy or at least take a look at it. I haven't. I haven't supported the game on Kickstarter in a long time. <laughs> I just prefer to wait for them when they come out of stores. So I'm not in any super hurry. hurry super hurry to get any. Let's see, I need to I need to go grab one color quickly. Now we're almost oh kick bump my camera again. Sorry guys. Almost done with the live stream tonight. I need to find the nun oil that's not gloss. There it is. There's two types of the nun oil shade that Games Workshop manufactures. I love the gloss stuff is great for metallic things, <clears throat> but in this case I need the normal one because I'm going to go in and try to put some sockets in those tiny little skulls there. And you know if you get a little bit of this outside the sockets, it, it's fine, they're skulls. <laughs> Maybe there's a hole punched in them, who knows. I don't know, I don't know what their fascination with skulls is, but you know, it's... Is that probably that whole just depressing gothic theme? They're like, hey, you know, let's. <clears throat> Lots of skulls is depressing. It's like human sacrifice and human slaughter, and that's just disturbing. So maybe that's what they're going for. I don't know. But I'm just taking my artificial layer extra small brush here, and I'm very gently trying to dab in the various eye sockets. There's apparently a weird hole right there. <laughs> with a small amount of the non-oil, non-gloss shades. This is the normal one. And you can, already, you can see there how all those little black spots, those are all the sockets of the skull. And I think that'll look pretty good once it, it dries. And that part of the sword is looking pretty good right there. So let me move on and I'm going to add one more base coat. I think I'll call it tonight's live stream done. I've been at this almost an hour now. We're making pretty good progress here. Oh, I was going to fix this little mess, wasn't I? So I'm just taking a small amount of linen white and I'm going in here and just kind of covering up this extra amount of red that got somehow added in between this oh part of the scabbard and the rest of the cloak. There we go. That'll work. So I like that. I think it looks pretty good, that piece of the scabbard right there. Here's the other half. That's good. Nope, that's the outside, inside of it. So there's the other half that I'm going to start painting up right now. I'm going to put a little bit of base paint down on this part of the sword, and we'll call that kind of done for the night then. I kind of ran out of stuff to talk about. I'm like, oh, hmm. I thought I had more interest in tabletop games coming up that I could ramble on about, but apparently I don't. So for the this particular piece of the sword here, it is Dark Angels, supposedly. So I'm going to work with some Caliban green, Caliban green base paint that apparently has some GW flocking stuck to it. <laughs> I think... The, the, oh no. Oh, that's right. In my little paint drawer here. I had a giant tub of GW flocking that sometime a long time ago. It spilled out. 
So there's a pile of it at the bottom of the drawer, and if you put the paint pods in there, they tend to get kind of it all stuck to it. All right, well, let's just put a small amount of this dark green paint on the sword, and we'll call tonight's painting session done. I think this is cloth. I don't know what this is, to be honest with you. It looks kind of like cloth material. So I'm thinking it may just be like a, a decorative cloth covering up the actual scabbard, but I'm really not 100% sure. But I think because this is supposed to be Dark Angels, I'm going to give it the nice Dark Angels green style treatment, which is the Caliban green, and then some highlights of Warpstone Glow and Snot Green, I believe is the other one it's called. Or it used to be called Snot Green. I don't know what it is now. I don't have it out. Um, but yeah, just going to finish up with this and that's good enough for tonight. All right, I think that's pretty good. I got the base coat down of this particular section of the scabbard. It looks like there's some sort of probably there's more silver gold work in there. <clears throat> Since the bottom is silver, we'll, we'll kind of keep going with the silver theme. I think I might probably put some brown in there first, and the idea being it's like a brown leather scabbard with some metallic silver decorations to it. But that's, like I said, going to be next time. So there we go. Just a little, little Caliban green there on that particular scabbard, and I think we'll call this thing done. Well, the stream done. Cypher still got a ways to go. I'm thinking... <clears throat> hmm. So this is episode six, I believe. I'm kind of, getting once again, getting a bit ahead of myself with what is on YouTube and what is on the Tabletop Battlefield feed versus what I've been live streaming. I think four just ended up on the Tabletop Battlefields, you know, the YouTube stream. Four is not gonna out the Tabletop Battlefield yet. Five was Wednesday, this is six. So this is the sixth uh, live stream here. So I'm thinking we might have 10, 11 episodes of this guy. I've gotta be close to halfway done at this point getting pretty close so there we go we can put the sword you can see the sword up on his back there and now you can see a tight they definitely looks green there next to his um bright white cloak or his you know his linen white cloak anyway <laughs> so maybe yeah probably like 10 11 12 episodes so we're somewhere in mid range of this series i don't know who i want to paint up next i gotta pick somebody I'll see whatever the new miniature is at the time and go from there. I was thinking of possibly painting up a Legion of Everblight figure from War Machine. That'd be kind of cool to see. But I'm not really sure yet. So we'll find out. But anyway, with that out of the way, if you want to find any more information about these live streams that you're watching right now on Twitch.tv, follow me here on Twitch.tv forward slash Rocket Robotics. Click the follow button up there and also be sure to turn on notifications because these random painting streams, I kind of just jump on whenever I have time to do them. I don't have a set schedule for them. They're usually sometime in the evening throughout the week. Sometimes I'll go on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon, depending on what my free time is looking like. But Thursdays at 8 p.m. Eastern time is when I do my Legends of Caladagia, Caladagia live show. Oh man, I'm losing my voice here. That's 8 p.m. Eastern time. That's when I stream something about Caladagia. Whether I'm working on some miniatures, maybe painting some miniatures, I might be working on a short film, I could be doing some artwork, all sorts of stuff related to tabletop game design in some way, shape, or another. And that is my one regular show each week. But once again, I'm Jason, the creator of the Tabletop Battlefield. I want to thank you guys all for watching, and have a good night.